right. Um, hi, everyone. I have with me today Mike Lerner. He's the host of the New, New Nation podcast, which I recommend everyone to check out also. Um, he, I've been following his social media channels, Instagram, and, and different stuff like that. And I like his approach, you can say, to evangelization, but also we have a shared interest in um, filmmaking and other art forms. So I wanted to like pop in with him and just have like have a conversation about all that and get to know each other. So thank you for coming on, Mike. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. This is always a pleasure. Yeah. So first, I guess, what were you always a... Um, a faithful, you can say like a faithful practicing Catholic, or did you have like a reversion story or something like m most of us? Uh, yes to both. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was, uh, I was actually baptized Lutheran. Uh, my mother is Catholic. She's a Latin Catholic from Central America. And when she came over to the country, I, I think that aspect of her life maybe took a backseat to, um, I don't want to say becoming more American, but while living in the States, marrying an American man, I think that that part of her life took a back seat. And then when she realized after our baptism into the Lutheran church, only because my father uh, was involved with the church architecturally, he was redesigning um, or he was doing some work for the church as an architect. And I guess he made friends with the lead pastor and we made friends with their with, with his wife and their kids. And she says, okay, this is a nice community. So when we were baptized, we were baptized in that church, but we only spent about a year as Lutherans. And then uh, my mom said, no, you're going to go to Catholic school. You're going to be raised as a Catholic and then entered Catholicism from there. And from the fourth grade to the end of my university uh, career, I was at Catholic schools, Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, Catholic university. And after Catholic university, I became agnostic through just having no responsibility apart from my own to attend church or to attend mass um, and to be faithful. So I spent about, man, I'd say about 10, 10 to 12 years, maybe even 15 years away from the faith. And it was only until the last couple of years after the start of a podcast I did a couple of years ago that I was reintroduced to Catholicism and became on fire and I had my daughter baptized and then really started to look into a lot of the aspects of Catholicism on my own. And now I'm a, a, a zealous and aggressive evangelist for Catholicism, I guess you can say, um, which is, I mean, which, which is partly an internet personality, but also, I mean, in person, friends and family will tell you that I'm actually like, I'm still trying to convince my father to convert and to become Catholic, to become a Christian. And I'm telling my mother, you know, you have to go to church more. My brother's the same thing. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting uh, journey these past this past century of my life because i'm going to turn 40 this year um but uh, i'm happy to be back yeah it's good to have you back i i had uh uh it's an interesting spirit i was talking with my friends we got our the house blessed yesterday me and my brother this is my hmm. i live together with my brother and he just bought this house and we got it blessed blessed according to the Melkite uh tradition and uh one of my friends was here and we were talking about the shrine that's in Birmingham. I think it's like mm -hmm. nearby the EWTN station. And we were like, kind of like talking about it as if it was a new comic book or something. And I thought to myself, man, like, man, I never thought I would get excited or have like positive conversations talking about like how cool a shrine is or like yeah, wanting or... to visit a particular church or something. Right. Exactly. To, like, it, that used to be, for me, that used to be something like, excitement coming from comic con or like upcoming show or like you know characters that i used to follow from particular series and now you know i hear stories of interesting saints like i I'm, i've been looking into deeply there's like this irish saint that is a mermaid also mm. right it's like in medieval times and i've been really deeply looking into it and i just like i'm like this is like I want to kind of bring her back, right? And so I'm like more excited about her now than I don't know, like Batman or Superman or whatever. It's like these saints become such a cool aspect of of life. But 
the thing with that also is that um you know you can you can pretend to be a jedi all you want but you'll never become one but you could mm-hmm. become a saint so it's like more th- worthwhile to follow follow that but um to follow up with what you just said is um have you always kind of been involved within the creative space as you know you have a podcast you talk about the the faith and other stuff that you you're involved a little bit with pop culture i know you're you do films and photography also yeah did you always have like this creative background along with you also yeah i think i'm one of three boys um and a very early memory that i have is my parents took us on i think our first real international vacation my my father Uh, took the family to Paris. And on the flight back, they said, we overbooked the flight. Would you guys be willing to stay an extra night for free, you know, in a hotel? And we'll give you something like $500 per person credit in miles or whatever. And my mom and dad were like, "Uh, yeah, we'll stay an extra night for that. Yeah, sure. Why not? One more night in Paris. And I was incredibly upset because that night we were supposed to fly back was the night of the Oscars. And I was going to miss the Oscars. And this was at a time where, you know, you had to watch television live. I think I was around maybe 12 or 13. Um, so I was, I was the, the one who was always interested in film, photography, music. And I expressed myself like that after college, um, after discerning for, you know, a heartbeat on pursuing law. I took the LSATs. Never applied to any law schools, though, but I did work at a law firm. And it was during that time where I was living on my own and with roommates and working at this law firm where I discovered photography. I don't know, you know, really where that came from, but I started to do work in that. And uh, I ended up uh, having a very quick uh, career as far as starting from the very low in terms of shooting for free and photographing my friends and photographing musicians who needed photographs because they didn't have money to pay for photographs to then touring the world with Justin Bieber as his tour photographer for four years. And that all happened within, I think like two to three years. So like very, very quick. Um, and through that time, I was exposed to a lot of other great creatives. Um, I, I had been on film sets. I watched that process and it wasn't until recently where I've had sort of a, a, a falling out of love. I think the 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 time of lust has worn off with me and photography. Like I had a very like lustful relationship with photography. I was just so attracted to it, um, and now it's turned and morphed into screenwriting. And uh, a couple years ago, I, I, I wrote a short uh, from an experience I had in Los Angeles on a blind date, well, quote unquote blind date. Um, and a friend of mine, I think they. I think they raised, you know, fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars to make this short off of the 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 screenplay that I wrote, and a buddy of mine directed and produced it and starred in it. And uh, I was in the hospital while he was doing that due to like a near fatal accident. But uh, I don't want to go off on any tangents. But yes, I had always been involved in some aspect of the creative arts, and I've always been drawn to that. And um, it's kind of, you know, I, I work a normal job now. I still work in a creative field where I work for a menswear company and I do get to express that every now and then, but it isn't the same as, you know, making photographs or writing. Uh, so I, 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 when I'm not doing that, when I'm not working the nine to five, I find myself exploring that still. And this is obviously maybe something we're going to talk about, but uh, this, this movie I'm trying to get made. Mm. Uh, so what is, what is your... Like kind of, I guess, two questions is how does how does Catholicism kind of like play into how you write stories now, if at all? Mm-hmm. And with that, um, how do you think that like our faith could play out in in somebody's influences or like how they approach art, whether it be writing a screenplay or yeah. uh, painting or whatever it may be? Well, I think it's like, it's like anything else. It's, it's, it's your environment. It could be your political ideology and it's also your faith. It's how you see the world and how you, how you experience the world. And, you know, coming from quote unquote libertarianism to conservatism and then ultimately Catholicism, which I believe is the only inevitable um, destination of a conservative person, 
I want to write stories that express that. So uh, Ethan Hawke just made a movie, which I'm sure you're aware of, called Wildcat, which is you know a, a biography about the short life of Flannery O'Connor, who's one of America's uh, most prolific Catholic writers. And you know the 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 uh, what's the right word? The tone or the underlying themes of that film has to do with the idea of grace and how a Catholic deals with the idea of grace. And so when I was thinking about what kind of story I wanted to write and portray on film, grace had something to do with that and suffering had something to do with that. And it was it started out as a um started out as a thought experiment where what would I do, how would I feel, what would happen to my faith, or how would the loss of family members affect my faith? And so I started to write a story based around that. And after I initially wrote it, I sent it to a lot of people and they said, this is really dark. I don't know if you want to take people down this really dark path. I said, okay. So there are elements in it which do talk about grace, talk about salvation, it talks about guilt, which is kind of like one of these uh, stereotypes about Catholics is that we are, we are, we're, our guilt is so much on display, like we wear our guilt on our sleeves. And um, I did want to portray a little bit about that. But I think, you know, with, with a story revolving around loss, there's obviously going to be feelings about guilt. So uh, that's what I wanted to bring to any sort of story that I was writing. And, you know, it's very hard to maybe write a Catholic comedy or something like that. Like, I didn't want it to be too on the nose or, you know, making some sort of satire. I wanted to write a drama about what a man, a Catholic man, would go through if he experienced, you know, something horrible and how would it affect his faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so how, how do you think, I'm trying to think of it because I'm trying, so like you, you know, you spoke to Anthony, um, before who did Triumph of the Heart, mm -hmm. um, which I recommend everyone to check out that interview between Mike and Anthony, cause it was a real good one. But, um, you know, th there's, there's, a. I think what. Uh, the Western mind now is kind of obsessive on, on a little bit of making something realistic or making sure they get all the facts right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know within the Catholic space, like if you look at something like EWTN or other spaces like that, that it's it's either all documentaries or it's like a straight up bio flick. Like there's no kind of like Lord of the Ring-esque type of content that's coming yeah. out, right? Yeah. Now, what's interesting, what Anthony did is he took a place, he took, kind of, like you could say in this, some extent, like a plot hole within, a, you know, he took the cell, which is not known of like everything that could have happened in there. It's just like, it's a generality. Like you can imagine, we know what Auschwitz was like based on the stories we've already been told. So it's probably, we have general ideas, but it's not like, you know, at 1103 at this night, Colby did this or whatever, right? Right. And so he kind of took that as an opportunity to like, we can tell a story of who Colby was and we have kind of like a creative freedom to invent something in some way, but keeping the nature of who Colby probably was. And I feel an ancient view of that. Um, you know, they did similar, there's similar things, right? Like St. Christopher is a good example that has like a ton of legend or stuff behind him or St. George of Slaying of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we always need to have the exact details, you can say, of a saint. And it's okay to fill in the gaps, you can say, with the nature of somebody by making them turn themselves into a deer or, you know, fighting pagans with fireballs like you see with Elijah and, you know, the Baal worshippers and stuff like that. Right. So. um what is, what is your kind of take like that? Do you feel the same way as far as particularly with like Catholic storytelling that sometimes it's way too documentary ask? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I suppose so. But I mean, there are elements of it happens a lot with Shakespeare. There are a lot. There there are so many modern day movies where it's 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 a retelling or re revisiting 
not a remake necessarily, but it'll 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 play on um, you know Much Ado About Nothing or Twelfth Night or something like that, and that's how you get Ten Things I Hate About You, and that's how you get uh, something like um, not Cyrano de Bergerac, but um, just any of those movies where a guy really likes a girl, but he doesn't know how to how to talk to her so then he finds a really good looking guy who likes the girl and then he feeds lines to that guy to get so that, that, that's just classic shakespeare so i think with catholicism you can take the the stories of the saints like saint gregory or uh, saint patrick um saint christopher and you can transfer those characteristics onto modern day people without having to direct some sort of epic tale which i mean tolkien did brilliantly with the lord of the rings he you know he uh, tolkien and then um uh, who's the guy who directed the lord of the wings peter jackson. Oh, peter jackson right 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 but um yeah i mean everybody everybody knows that tolkien was definitely inspired by the life of christ and the 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 catholic church when he wrote the lord of the rings so i think that you can create a fantasy world without having to directly infuse these historical catholic figures so when i think about you know my protagonist in my film he's a guy who's had to struggle with a lot of violence in his past he's a former special forces operator are there any saints who had violent pasts yeah there are plenty there's saint saint moses the black right Mm -hmm. uh there's saint paul there there are a bunch of these people who have had to wrestle with very dirty and very sullied pasts who have found redemption and who have found God's grace. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, spot on or on the nose. And I think I was talking to somebody, it may have been Anthony or it may have been um, uh, Eric Groth who executive produced Wildcat, but we were talking about ways where you know, Catholic filmmaking, or if there was a Catholic studio that wanted to emerge in the sort of same tone as like an A24 or something like that, where they make gritty movies, they maybe even make hard to digest films. But can we do it in such a way where we're not beating people over the head with the catechism, or we're not making, you know, another movie about uh, Mother Teresa or something like that? (laughs) You know, how can... And I don't want to say, you know, how can we be worldly, but how can we, I guess, appeal to the world with this, not masked, but maybe a slightly muted Catholicism, where people would say, I really like the message of this film. Oh, the director said this about this film, or, oh, the director or writer is Catholic. Let me explore this a little bit more. Um I think that's people. That's what people have done with memes on the internet. I mean, I, I've told people plenty of times that I was, I was sort of evangelized through Catholic memes on the internet and it, whether they're just made by, you know, some silly autistic kid or which they most likely probably are. I mean, it caught my attention, right. And it's not some clean watered down, um, you know, join the Catholic church. It was a lot of these um, crusading type memes uh, that, that I found appealing. So I, I think there's a way to reach people without being too on the nose. Yeah, I think I think there's like a couple of things going on there. Like through my, I so one one thing I think is, um, and I honestly can't. I think it can't, this particular thought comes from a Protestant way of thinking, is that we look at something what what um, what evil does, right? Like we'll look at something that is satanic to us or pagan, and we just assume that that behavior is evil in and of itself because the pagans do it, mm-hmm. but. To me, whatever evil replicates should show to us that there's good, there's something good in that because evil wouldn't copy what is not good. But meaning like, you know, if you think of what a black mass would look like, for example, it looks more similar to a Catholic mass because Satan himself wants to be worshipped like God. Mm-hmm. So you can find the truth in that. Now, does that make mass evil? Not necessarily, right? There's like a target. And then the second thing is that things things in a way live in a hierarchy it doesn't live in a hierarchy like the of power like the left likes to say but just like there's things that are more important and less important and so you have so you have like a ritual of brushing your teeth and brushing your teeth is important Mm -hmm. but just because it's a ritual doesn't mean it's necessarily it's like the same thing as going to mass, but mass is obviously more important because it's geared towards God. And then we have right. all these other smaller rituals on the top. So 
at times we we have this you know we have a movie about a saint and we almost treat it in the same way like we say like we need to treat the story of a saint the same way we treat the mass like it's almost like overly like if there's nothing anything overly theological or anything in it we're automatically like this isn't a good movie right right but but in a, in a story fairy tales even in the bible you have to show the terrible stuff that happens too in order for there to be growth you know the reason christ came down in the first place is because we kept failing right there's a lot of failure in that a lot of death a lot of different stuff that happened and you need that kind of same trope within stories also that exist mm -hmm. and uh and it's not all information and i think due to um over a long span of time of both like the enlightened movement and like protestants constantly calling out catholics of like oh you're nonsense satanical stuff we we've kind of been pulling back on the stuff you can say that enchanted the church and it became more and more just like analytical and that's why you see sometimes like a little bit less beauty in the churches or anything like that because we don't want to we feel like we scandalize people if we show like a serpent around the columns in our churches or something right, you know yeah. what i mean but mm -hmm. but if you don't you know but if you don't understand it, then it may come off evil to you, but doesn't necessarily, the symbols in themselves are not evil. They all tell a particular story. Um, yeah. And which, uh, you know, it's a little bit, well, first I'm going to ask where, where are you currently with, with the film with the script? Have you, are you looking right now into, are you still in pre-production? Are you shifting to production? What is, what is the timeline kind of look currently? The, the screenplay was probably, um, formally finished. I did. I did a podcast about about the film. I can't remember when exactly. Um, let's just let's just say late last year. So the end of the end the end of twenty twenty three. And every now and then I'll go back and I'll change some lines of dialogue or you know maybe change a setting. But so this the the screenplay is finished. Um, and it. And right now it lives it lives on the blacklist, which you can see. And for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what the blacklist is, the blacklist is basically a repository of screenplays that screenwriters can upload to. And if they want to, they can either make the screenplay public or private, and they can have it evaluated by people who work in the industry. And people have to have a bona fides who read the screenplay of you know working on someone's desk, whether it's a producer, a filmmaker, for at least a year. That's how you're able to evaluate these screenplays. And so I think I've had six evaluations now and uh, they've scored good enough to end up on a quarterly list of like the blacklist's top list. So I think it's like the top, it's either the top 100 or top 200 uh, screenplays on there. And it's just one of those places where, you know, if it's read by the right person, you might get a bit of luck and it might get passed on to someone and then you might get some sort of um, attention to it where you can get some development movement on it. But right now, mine is in pre-production. I've tried to send it out to some people who I've wanted to either be in it or direct it. And because Hollywood is such a, it's such a, it's the right word, I guess, such a, like a gatekeeping sort of industry if the movie doesn't have any sort of money behind it no one's even going to read it they won't even take time to read it so you can have the godfather as a script but if there's no money behind it they're not going to read it I, i've gotten you know talk to me when you have financing okay so where the project is now is i'm going to take a scene from it and make a short out of it use it as a proof of concept to maybe try and finance it that way or you know maybe put the short into some film festivals or something like that um, i've talked about doing that for a while now and with starting the new job it might take a little bit because i want to i want to do it right i, I don't want to make mistakes around it um, and i don't want to give this half-assed version of of something where it, it kind of dissuades people from wanting to financially invest in it so that's where I am right now. And uh, I, I've, I've asked my priest if I could shoot in the church, and he's already sort of given the green light for that. So right now, you know, it's just one of those things of raising maybe one or $2,000 to help pay people, uh, maybe, you know, get some friends involved to make this thing and to find some local actors to, uh, to spend a day shooting this thing. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, and, you know, if there's success with this short, then the possibility of me even directing it 
um, becomes more attractive because initially I didn't want to direct it. Initially, I thought, you know, why don't we leave that job to a professional, someone who's who's done it before um, on a larger sort of uh, bandwidth? Because I've directed, you know, little music videos and mm -hmm. little documentaries like that, but it's not the same as as a feature film or even you know for for a short film. So that's where that's where the project is right now. It's it's in kind of like this limbo of pre production and trying to create a, uh, um, a fundraising vehicle, if you will. And it's tough because Ethan Hawke, I mean, it, you have to think about in, a, in an environment where it's tough for Ethan Hawke to find financing for a movie to make, you know, that's kind of where we are right now. But luckily, you know, hoping that maybe I can reach out to if there are any sort of Catholic organizations who give grants to people to make these types of films that have uh, maybe a message of Catholicism in it. Uh, that would be great. I've been researching that. That's a little bit tougher to find. Um, I don't want to go to my parish and be like, hey, guys, do you want to chip in you know, 1000 or $2,000 to help me make this film where I can even secure more financing to make it? So I, I think it's something that um, is going to take maybe a little bit longer than I anticipate, but it's going to happen. Um, you know, it's just, finding, it's just finding people who believe in it in enough to make it. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, I had a idea for uh, a film recently that I might take the same approach to what you're doing to yours. Mm -hmm. And basically, so I, you know, there's problems in it for sure, but I did love the series, the History Channel series, The Vikings. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I, one, I, I mean, there's many things, but the one thing that frustrates me of shows like that is the fact you know, there's always a character that converts and then at some point has like, oh, I miss the old days of like when I worship Thor, like I miss that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a huge misunderstanding of when people can like when people convert, like if you were a Viking, right? Like people don't realize when people say like Christians forced the Viking to convert, I think that's ridiculous. Like you don't understand who the Vikings were then if you think Christians somehow forced them, like the Vikings didn't bow down to anyone. Mm -hmm. The fact that they converted in a sense on their own by hearing the message is a miracle of it of itself yeah and the fact that they converted through hearing this and seeing the actions of christians says a lot more that i'm sure they didn't miss their old ways of having to kill each other to sacrifice to thor or odin right and so when i hear you know there was a scene in there where one of the characters converts he's like becomes like a basically a part of uh the kingdom of France and stuff. And he says like, Oh, I miss Thor's hammer and stuff. I'm like that would never, you know, not, I shouldn't say never, but the likelihood of that happening is very low. Mm -hmm. So I have an idea of, a uh, of basically like this Viking type character that is seeking actively to get baptized. Mm. But through that, it takes like a Scott Pilgrim approach. Not, not so much that it's like quirky and all that stuff, but he has to basically defeat, right the previous gods as he's traveling to get this baptism right so he comes across like freya and different stuff like that and there's like these battles and he basically has to kill them to approach them and they all are kind of calling him to come back and he doesn't right. want to that's a cool idea um, and so you know for the short idea i i have it more so where uh, it would be a little different it would be wake it would be basically the film but more condensed and it would just be him praying and then odin appears and is basically trying to tempt him into coming back like you know you're worshiping this man that died on that that is weak like you know he died on the cross and this other guy and then the, there's an actual battle that ensues between them yeah but that in that i would want in the full film to come across and i, I would base the the story off of saint christopher and different th things like that um okay across in the river but so you know but like you said it's then difficult because you know, you hear, you heard it with um, Sound of Freedom of all the other ones like Hollywood, Disney, all these other people don't want, unless you're part of like this woke culture or whatever, like they do not want new stuff. They just want to keep feeding off yeah. nostalgia. And even if you are feeding off nostalgia, they, you have to play this DEI political game, unfortunately, of like, do you have all these colored, like different ethnicities and diversity in your film do you have this and that and so like that that becomes a route that's slightly closed off and so like your other option is like all right well what about angel studios or do i do a kickstarter like how do i right. approach this well i mean right. the thing that's about angel studios is, is cabrini lost a fabulous amount of money 
an amazing amount of money. I guess on the on the strength of Sound of Freedom, is the same director, but the film Cabrini it, it it was good, but it goes back to kind of what we talked about before. It was just this this direct on the nose biopic, right about mm. about the saint, and I think that they thought that the Christian world because Angel Studios is not a Catholic company. Yeah, it's more. It's, it's a Christian movie. company. So I, I think they aimed a little bit too high making a Catholic biopic. On the other hand, you have a movie like Padre Pio, which if you've seen it, you know it's really not about Padre Pio. But it was done by um, Abel Ferrara, who's kind of, you know, like this cult director who who did um, Bad Lieutenant and a couple of other movies. And that tried to appeal to this indie crowd and then it tried to appeal to Catholics as well. The marketing was a little weird. And then when people figured out, oh, this movie's not even really about Padre Pio. It's this weird, you know, love letter to Marxism. Mm-hmm. That failed. So it's it, it, it also has to do a lot about with, you know, Hollywood and, you know, diversity quotas. And, you know, your movie can't even be nominated for an Oscar if it doesn't mean certain uh, diversity quotas. Mm-hmm. But I think about movies like Dune. I think about movies like Prisoners, which just happen to be, you know, um, same director, yeah, same director. But then I also think about movies like Manchester by the Sea, and um, a, a movie that that really stuck out to me is a movie Minari, which A twenty four put out, which is about a Korean family's uh, immigration from Korea to you know the rural South, mm-hmm. um, the United States, and their um, dream of owning their own farm and you know uh, being independent. But it also has a very, very strong Christian tone to the film. I mean, it, it's not on the nose, but, you know, there's a church where, you know, the, the new family starts going to church. They, they have an eccentric neighbor who helps out on the farm that is a, a Pentecostal, but it's not in a mocking way. And mm-hmm. I think the director was very gracious when he did that because he could have done it, right? He could have just mocked Christianity and just shown how, you know, how the modern world views it as sort of um, uh, uh, not ridiculous, but fantastical in the, in the way that like, okay, um, you know, this Pentecostal is is almost like some sort of pagan appearing person who speaks in tongues and does all this other kind of um, silly stuff where we could talk about that. But uh, it's it's probably one of the strongest Christian-themed movies that I've seen in the last two or three years. Um, so I think if more movies existed like that, uh, and if there was a studio that put out movies like that, specifically for Catholics, not specifically for Catholics, but specifically made by Catholics, that would be cool to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have you seen the show Shogun? Yes. What what are your thoughts about that one? Um, you know, that they try to show the Catholics as being the bad guys and have, you know, the, the Protestant Englishmen constantly bad mouthing the Catholics and stuff like that. And you know, you, you, you do see the history of the spread of Catholicism in the um in the Far East, uh, from from empires like Portugal, which is very interesting. And you know, the 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 film Silence, Martin Scorsese says he silences Silence deals with that theme, but to me, every time I watched it, it was just it, at least you know the first half of the series, the first couple of episodes. I'm like, okay, they're just bashing Catholics now. I see, I see that. Oh, really? I didn't, I didn't get that strong of a Catholic bashing in it because I think, I, th- I, I, I mean, I don't know if it was on purpose, but they did, they did have several moments where like they, they showed that there was kind of like that the Catholic Church and the Portuguese government were like their own en- entities, mm-hmm. like when they had the black ship. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't know what he was, the bishop or whatever, the one, the guy with like the white collar and the huge cross was clearly didn't want to hurt that relationship. Mm-hmm. But they did have that Jesuit priest there that, you know, is the translator gave, and stuff. Yeah. That, yeah. That the translator that you know his main goal was to try to keep good relationships between that to build a church, right? Like to save yeah. souls. Like he he says that open openly and i don't think they i don't know if they meant it on purpose but to me the protestant guy does come off a little naive like he comes off like a protestant to me right um he didn't he didn't come he didn't be, become like this overly heroic figure that like 
you know, purged purged these evil Catholics from his something. There was some kind of ignorance about him that is made clear, I guess, through like a difference in faith. But yeah, no, I got that. And when I meant Catholic bashing, I meant that specifically from that character's perspective. Like he yeah. was just doing a lot of Catholic bashing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, and I mean the uh, not to go off on a tangent too, but in general, I've been learning a lot about like the ev- evangelization out east, specifically Japan and stuff, and even Saint Maximilian Colby's work right there, and mm-hmm. all that, and it's so interesting. And then recently, with the talk about, um, I think there was like a little Twitter discussion between whether the nukes were, um, oh yeah, like, uh, more they, they targeted this, the, the, yeah, and that the, yeah, they and targeted the cities, the most, yeah, and that happened. Yeah those happen to be the most two like Catholic cities or something, which mm-hmm. I've obviously never been taught. So it's just like interesting to like learn the fullness, I guess you can say of that history of what right. actually has been going on. Yeah. Um, so la- last thing I kind of want to talk about, so I'm going to divert the conversation a little bit. So like you mentioned, you have the podcast, you're pretty active on Instagram and all that stuff. And one thing I love that you do, I, I know you get called out, I guess, sometimes even by Catholics that it's uncharitable and stuff, but I do love the, the approach of kind of like just bullying people and making them feel stupid, which I think yeah. we're li- like, I think, I think, you know, my, uh, we have young adults nights and stuff in my church and a lot of people ask him like, oh, you know, I'm, there's my friend, he thinks this about Catholics, how can I can him? And he says something like, you know, don't argue with a pig because a pig wants to get dirty and he likes it. And then you're going to get dirty too. And so, yeah. and along with that, I think it's okay to just like, sometimes just like basically do that thing where it's like, you're dumb. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, I think, right. I think it's a fine approach to just sometimes shame them. Like, how did you basically from being active, like when did that kind of thing became uh, part of your character, I guess? Well, I don't, media yeah. And I don't, I'll start out by saying I don't necessarily want to make people feel stupid. Yes, um, that's a strong or, word. Or word. that I'm even or that I'm even bullying people because I don't I don't want to make people upset. And I, I get it. There's, you know, some sort of anti uh, antagonistic behavior that they're trying to get under my skin and trying to cause me to become upset. But I don't I don't like being lied to, I suppose. And so when I see someone who's slandering the church or, you know, um, slandering someone else a a fellow catholic i don't like that so it's not necessarily that i'm being a bully but i believe i'm standing up uh for the faith and i I, it's it's one of those things where i was talking to somebody about this the other day where um i said that you know maybe my mission is to you know be this sort of defender of the faith from people trying to slander the church and maybe that's been bestowed upon me by me right it might not even be the holy spirit it might not be god it's just you know some maybe some title i've given to myself but um there there are there are a lot of other great instagram influencers and other feeds who do a really good job of um tempered evangelization right there are plenty of good feeds that 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 speak with grace and that speak with love and kindness and all that stuff. Um, but when I call someone out, I don't do it out of a lack of love in that case. And I might not even think about it this way, but I, you know, if, if I call you out for lying, it's not because I don't love you. It's not because I hate you. It's because I don't, I don't like lying. Right. I believe that we should stand up for the truth. I mean, we should be able to show the truth to other people and point people out who are, who are, who are, purposefully lying to to slander the faith um and i think maybe i've gone too far a couple of times i mean my wife spoke to me about this the other day where she's like you take a lot of time you know exposing you know taking the screenshots of either dms or comments and then tagging those people and then you know showing you know the followers that you have like look at this person he just said something so dumb we should shame them and maybe it is god who you know, the night that I do that is saying, maybe you went too far. Maybe that's not how you should treat other people. So I think I'm going to maybe stop doing that. The the way that right. I did that, that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like, because I've gotten plenty of DMS before that. I was like, Mike, I love it. When you, when you, uh, when you out these people, when you show, when you show us what they say behind closed doors in a DM or something like that, I'm like, yeah, well maybe, you know, pearls before swine, maybe I should not interact with these people apart from maybe one reply to a comment and move on. However, saying that I will still zealously defend the church, 
but maybe not so much in this sort of teenage girl type of way mm. where it's like, oh, you said this to me, I'm going to expose it to everybody. Um, but yeah, I, I, I understand because uh, there's one uh, person who DM me was like, hey, I'm a Catholic. I think the way you speak to people and I think the way that you show in your stories a DM or a comment, I, I think it's unchristlike. And initially reading those sorts of things, I'm saying, listen, you know, people are lying. I'm going to call them out. Christ wasn't nice. He was, he, he was kind, but he was also, he also brought justice to people. So I'm not going to let people just, you know, um, slander the church. And then I also thought, yeah, there's probably a way to do things that turn maybe more people off than attract them. Because I'm sure my wife is like, what, how, what do you, how do you think people are reacting to when they're seeing you go off on some like spurgy story timeline of you like outing all these people? And then like, do you think they're looking like, yeah, I might get him? Or are they looking like, what's he doing? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a waste of time. Doesn't he have kids? You know, kind of, kind of something like that. And I realized like my wife, I, I believe my wife is a living saint. I think I think she's right. I think she has she has no time for my feelings. So she has grounded me and she tells me the truth and I love her for it and I respect her for it. So um it might cause a change in how I start responding and reacting to people online. So that's why like the last post that I have on Instagram is this um text post saying Protestants have you ever been to a mass? And if so, what did you like? What did you dislike? Rather than saying Protestants convert now, you know what I mean? You know, something like that, rather than being so harsh and so gritty, just kind of extending an olive branch, if that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I feel like at some time, I mean, I know I personally, sometimes if I said something stupid and someone called me out for saying something stupid, it did affect me in a way of, like looking into it and being like wow i did really i sound like an idiot doing that mm -hmm. so like um you know on social media it's hard to read the tone in the, the same oh, way yeah. right so yeah. i can see how people sometimes see those kind of things and are thinking like what you said like doesn't he have kids like what is he doing right um i i i for example was looking at the other way because i was thinking it from my own experience of like when people are like what you just said makes no sense like you haven't even read this, like, have you? And then it's like, no, I haven't. And it's like, why are you speak? You know what I mean? Like, there's sometimes right. shame does serve a good purpose for someone to, like, look deeply into what they're talking about or, like, double check where they're coming from. Yeah, and there are things like, you know, me doing the same thing and posting to people, like, look how dumb this guy is. He says, where in the Bible does it say to pray to Mary? You know, it's like, everybody knows doesn't say it anywhere in the bible right like but that doesn't discount what our traditions of the church have been for the last i don't know 1800 years right so it's it's something that i've been thinking okay how to reach out best to this person do i shame them publicly or do i dm them an article from somewhere catholic answers do i dm them a portion of the catechism and do i do it in a neighborly way and in a loving way there 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 have been things that there have been ways that i've behaved in the past that i've corrected so I think it's only natural for me that in trying to bring people closer to Christ that I that I that that I change maybe a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I've been dealing with. I mean, in the span of forty eight hours. Mm. And so, last question I have for you before I wrap this up is basically, um, I, I started following you originally when you still had the kind of like the joint podcast with that other girl. I think mm -hmm. her name was Gina. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so. What was, um, when you first started going into podcasting and having basically like the brand that you have now, New Nation, um, was the goal kind of basically like uh, to a small sense like evangelization through interacting with pop culture and politics and stuff like that? Or, you know, what was, what was the idea a little bit behind New Nation and even that podcast before that you had with Gina? Yeah, I mean, that podcast that I had with Gina was just a way to have private conversations in public. So, you know, uh, Gina is very involved in the in the conservative movement uh, politically and ideologically, and I'm sure she still is now. But, um, you know, it was kind of like that Seinfeld thing, like, what, you know, what is the show going to be about? And they're at the diner. It's like, this should be the show. Like, that's kind of what it was like, you know, us yeah. talking about politics and culture and then making it public and kind of reaching out to people who we'd want to have on the show. And it was good. It was good. We found, we found a little bit of success in that, but I think 
I started to, you can watch the progression. Like you can watch the natural progression of me towards Catholicism. And I think, you know, the show ended because of, you know, private matters I don't necessarily want to go into, but I think Mm -hmm. Gina and I are different uh, religious, religiously because she's, she's uh, Orthodox and I'm Catholic. And, you know, it, it would be great to still have that show where an Orthodox Christian and a Catholic can, you know, talk about things and have, you know, so many, you know, different guests on, but the show ended and that's life. And sometimes things change. So I think me moving more Catholic, I think the, the, the only ultimate end was for me to have a Catholic podcast. And it's not strictly like the, the podcast isn't, you know, Mike, the Catholic tries to evangelize people. No, the, the, the podcast is Mike experiences this or Mike sees this and talks about it and maybe tries to frame it from a Catholic point of view. Um, and that's what the show is. Like the last episode was about um, uh, uh, Harrison Butker's uh, speech at the Benedictine College, which, by the way, apparently the the nuns, the Benedictine nuns on that campus wrote some letter um, totally distancing themselves from that speech, which is, I, I don't know how that happened, um, but uh, they should probably be reprimanded for that. Anyway. Um, so that's what that's what the current podcast is. It has guests every now and then. And the thing is, is when you have a full time job and you have maybe only Sunday to have free time to yourself, do you want to do it making podcasts? We're doing one right now. Or do you <laughs> want to do it spending time with your family? You know, the podcast isn't every day. The podcast isn't twice a week. The podcast is closer to once a week or whenever I have a thought about something and I have time to get it out. Um, would I like to do it full time? Obviously. I would love yeah. to do it full time um, because that would give me a little bit more freedom in the creative part of my life where, you know, I'm trying to get this film made. But um, yeah, that, 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 that is essentially what the podcast is. It's not necessarily specifically evangel evangelization. It's just maybe just talking about Catholicism with current events and cultural moments. And I do like talking about film. It would be cool if, you know, if I had like a Catholic movie podcast or something like that. But if you, if, if you, I'm sure you and I both follow the film Pope, um, yeah. which, you know, he's retiring and, you know, going into seminary, which is awesome. But something like, like he's a person that I will have on the show at one point. So someone like that. Um, and yeah, that's all it is. It, the, the show that I had with Gina was far more popular. Uh, we 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 had a we had a decent um, uh, base of subscribers on YouTube. Our Instagram was growing, and uh, I took over the Instagram, and we lost. I lost, not we, but I lost a bunch of followers, and it's kind of just stayed. The number of followers has just kind of stayed the same for the past, you know, seven eight months. Um, and I don't really post much to YouTube because I only do audio podcasts now. So it's just tough. It's just tough. the The life of a content creator is and can be very consuming, where it doesn't leave time for anything else. So, yeah, no, you you have to, and it moves quickly, right? Like if mm-hmm. you're not constantly looking what's going on, especially if you're involved with pop culture and stuff, like everything that's going on. If you didn't right. get on this Harrison, like this Harrison speech, like right when it happened, I mean as as outraged people are by it i think you know by next week it's like why is this guy still talking about right. it right yeah and, that, and that's one thing i did start writing for this um substack called house and habit and it, house and habit is a huge instagram account uh, where it's run by this uh woman jessica who um started out covering britney spears years ago the conservatorship and then it's moved on to all things pop culture and politics but the first article i wrote was about um you know, Crisis King and Candace Owens and her firing from the Daily Wire. And that was one of her most popular articles. And uh, I, I became now a contributing writer to this where I do a um, I do one article per quarter. And I wrote an article about how former OnlyFans uh, workers or creators were converting either to Christianity or Catholicism. And I submitted that like a month and a half ago because there was a moment in time where this was talked about on a lot of Catholic pages and it was talked about a lot on YouTube and it still hasn't been published yet. So it's kind of, I'm waiting for them to publish this thing. Like, Hey guys, you're kind of missing the moment. No one's going to really talk about this anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to be right on top of these sort of cultural moments. Yeah, no, for sure. And you know, to, to quickly just follow up on something you said, like the thing about, um, you know, 
at the end of the day, the Bible is showing us kind of like how reality works, you can say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, you know, you, like you said, you see all these people, you can say like these misfits, like you have like OnlyFans, like basically prostitutes. You have comedians like Russell Brand that, that used to be like a womanizer and things like that, mm -hmm. all these people, and they're all converting. And it's like similar, you know, when you look at the story of St. Mary Magdalene, obviously he was uh, lived a Protestant prostitute type of lifestyle you have saint mary of elizabeth you know that's kind of like later on after the crucifixion stuff but you know all these stories are kind of like showing up to for people and like you know the atheists try to ignore it for so long and all this like reality behind the bible is just like blowing up in their face and all this like weird stuff is happening and then you know you try to explain like why is jeffrey star taking these weird pictures at the catholic altar or why are they doing this weird basically satanic ritual in the middle of the grammys and it's like yeah well because you guys were avoiding for god for so long and that's exactly what it says would happen if you guys didn't follow him mm -hmm. so um yeah it's, it's 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 interesting to see as with especially obviously because our culture has become so involved with politics now and stuff like that right but it, but, but it's like you said it's tying it back to when you're making catholic films about that aren't so on the nose because i referenced you know before i really got into the meat of the article i i talked about saint it was saint mary of egypt and then saint um saint uh, thais and these were two women who had scandalous pasts where they were just both kind of uh prostitutes and um and uh, nymphomaniacs almost and were just uh, you know harlots and who who had these really big conversion moments and who and who lived the rest of their lives piously even away from away from the world uh seeking god's grace and you could tie that into what's going on today right but the the the, the article that i wrote was more about is it genuine or not because there's one creator who's on who's on twitter I forget her name, Miss B or something like that, who converted to Catholicism and her conversion um, seems from the outsider's perspective more genuine than the only friends creator who everybody's talking about. And uh, so the article, the article's theme was, are we, should we or ought we doubt someone's conversion story? Right. Probably mm -hmm. not. But, you know, we can't judge the hearts of people, but we can view their actions and, and then judge those. So hopefully it gets put up soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll look for I'll I'll keep an eye out for it. I would be interested in reading it for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Mike, it's approaching an hour, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. There's like a lot more things that kind of like opened up as we're discussing that I'd like to talk to you about. But yeah, we can we can um, do this again. Yeah. So I'll have to reach back out at some point. But uh, once again, thank you for you know sitting down with me to kind of chat. Uh, about you a little bit and uh, about new nation and different stuff like that uh, i'll definitely still be you know a follower checking out what's going on on your side of things awesome and uh yeah for anyone watching uh please obviously like and subscribe mine follow uh mike's channels the new nation on instagram mm -hmm. and it's on youtube for audio podcasts sometimes he uploads too um and i what's it called and i hope to talking to everyone soon